We are producers, engineers, singers, songwriters, musicians, tour and live production crew, and thousands more of us. Without us, the music stops. We, we need, need your, your help to keep the music playing. Support those impacted today at musiccares.org. Recording Academy and our Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Department, I want to personally welcome you to Music, Purpose, and Community. I'm Jennifer Blakeman, President of the New York Chapter of the Recording Academy, and we're pleased to have you join us for an important conversation with creators and professionals who are helping us to close the accessibility gap on and off the stage in our industry. I want to extend a personal thank you to Sign Nexus, who is providing live interpretation and transcription services for us today. This virtual program marks the first time the Recording Academy is using accessibility features in its programming. And we thank Sign Nexus for helping us make this happen. In addition, I would like to acknowledge and thank our moderator, Lachi. Sharon Tapper, who is the chair of our chapter's advocacy committee, along with the committee members, and our DEI team, Valicia and Ryan, for being such wonderful partners and key stakeholders in making today's program a reality. Without further ado, join me in welcoming our moderator. She is a nominated singer-songwriter and record producer having worked across the globe with the likes of Snoop Dogg, Styles P, and many more. She's a go-to vocalist and songwriter in both the U.S. and Europe's house, EDM, and trance scenes, where she has seen her music spotlighted in the New York Times, Huffington Post, Oprah Radio, and NPR. Her music has also been featured on national television, radio, major playlists, and in feature films. As an artist who is legally blind, she is a proponent for disability representation and entertainment. Speaking and consulting on inclusion around the country to Fortune 500 companies and at national events for the National Endowment for the Arts, New York's Ad Week, and Women in Music, we are so happy to have her with us today. Please join me in welcoming Lachi. Hi, Lachi. Hi, thank you so much, Jennifer, for that introduction. And I'm super excited that this is the first accessible event from the Recording Academy. And why I'm so passionate about disability inclusion? Well, I grew up as a blind kid and I was passionate about music and entertainment, but you know, I didn't have a lot of folks that sort of looked like me and kind of had my situation. It made it really difficult for me to have sort of a, I wanna be that type of goal. To find identity, especially in music specifically. During my time at NYU, one of the things I noticed was that my professors weren't gonna be the ones to make it happen. I was. So I decided I want to be that role model I didn't have. I, I want to be the role model that the industry hasn't seen in folks with disabilities. I want the industry to foster and promote such role models because the next generation absolutely deserves it. So here we are. And I'm honored to present this amazing, accomplished industry panel of role models. Our first panelist has won NPR's Tiny Desk Contest in 2020. 
Yeah, I'm sorry, in 2016. She's since toured in 45 states and nine countries. She's opened for Wilco and the Decemberists. And she's frequented, um, she frequently speaks at many engagements around the country. She shared her perspective on PBS NewsHour on being with Krista Tippett and Oh, I'm so sorry, folks. It's a little complicated when you are visually impaired and trying to follow along. <laughs> and throughout, she has done two TED Talks showcasing her views on disability and accessibility. She is working on a new memoir that she'll be releasing in 2020. And in response to the pandemic, she's having weekly concerts every Sunday, and they are on YouTube. Please join me in welcoming violinist and songwriter Galen Lee. Hello. Hi, Lachi. Um, so I can't hear you, sorry. I think you're muted. For... Hi, I just wanted to say, hey, thank you so much. Oh. For <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Um, yeah, my name is Galen, and I'm from Duluth, and I'm very excited to be here. Thank you so much. Our next panelist is a hip-hop artist nominated, uh, I'm sorry, national motivational speaker and paraplegic who uses music and his life story to speak out against social injustices and encourages people to never give up. He's performed everywhere from the United Nations to the White House and has worked with amazing artists like Snoop Dogg and Stevie Wonder. He, joined, he also got his bachelor's degree in music and received a music essentials certificate from NYU. At 17, he was accidentally shot and left paralyzed. Despite his setback, he along with his best friend, a fellow paraplegic started hip hop group and movement for Will City to inspire change, create more opportunities for people with disabilities and encourage at-risk youth to stay away from gun violence. It's with my pleasure to welcome Namel Tapwaters Norris. Hi, Namel. Hey, what's up? How you doing? As he said, Namel Tapwaters Norris, represent one half of the movement, Four Wheel City. Just here to share my insight um, on what we've been doing to inspire, educate, advocate, and entertain, and just show the world what people with disabilities could do through music and create opportunities and through, through our story and social change. Thank you so much, Namel. So glad to have you here. Our next panelist has over a decade of songwriting, recording, producing, and touring experience, and has made his mark in the music industry with his unique voice and his soulful guitar playing. Through uh, an accident, he did receive a spinal cord injury, which set him in a wheelchair at age 18. He relearned playing guitar with paralyzed hands and channels his trials through his music. Please welcome Ryan Gooch Nelson to the panel. Hi, Ryan. Hey, hey Lachie. Hey, everybody. I'm super excited to be here. Um, like Lachie said, I'm a quadriplegic, and I just try to uh, spread positivity and motivation through my music. I have a foundation called the Music in Motion Foundation, and uh, we just try to raise awareness and uh, money for music therapy and things like that. So. I'm honored to be here, honored to be on the panel, and just grateful for you guys coming along and putting this together. Thank you so much. Our next panelist is a Grammy-winning and twice Oscar-nominated singer, songwriter, best known for co-writing Michael Jackson's Man in the Mirror, and for her duet with MJ, I Just Can't Stop Loving You. First discovered by Quincy Jones, She's toured internationally as a feature and background vocalist with Jackson, Jones, Madonna, 
Sergio Mendez, and others. Artists who have recorded on her original songs include Aretha Franklin, Miles Davis, Earth, Wind & Fire, Common, Jamie Foxx, Jennifer Hudson, and more. As a recording artist, her first hit was a, a duet with former Temptations member, oops, with former Temptations member Dennis Edwards. Don't look any further. Please join me in welcoming Saida Garrett. So happy to have you with us. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm so glad to be here. I'm Saida Garrett, and I um, work diligently every year with the Race to Erase MS. I was diagnosed with MS just seven years ago. And um, I feel lucky because I have uh, the type of MS that uh, is remittent and recurring as opposed to uh, some of the more serious uh, forms of the disease. I'm working yearly for a cure for this disease and I work with Nancy Davis of the Race to Erase MS Foundation. Um, I'm just happy to be a part of this panel. I'm really impressed with the stories that I've heard thus far and I, um, like seriously right now my heart is so full and I, feel, <laughs> I feel so privileged to be in the company of, of you guys thank you so so happy to have you with us Saida so 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 happy well let's round out today's panel um we have Valicia Butterfield Jones from the Recording Academy with us Valicia has been over 20 years driving change at the intersection of entertainment politics and tech She's, she's currently the Chief Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Officer at the Recording Academy. Uh, but before that, she served as the Global Head of Inclusion for Google. She was the Deputy Director of Public Awareness for International Training uh, for International Trade in the Obama Administration and the National Youth Vote Director for Obama for America, helping to deliver one of the highest youth voting turnouts in America. Valacia is also a mom, she's a wife, she's an author, and co-founder of the Women in Entertainment Empowerment Network. If you wanna find out and learn more about Valicia, follow her on Instagram at Valicia. Valicia, welcome. Thank you so much, Lachi, for that introduction and moderating today's panel. It is an honor um, to be here uh, with all of our distinguished panelists today. Um, I joined the Recording Academy um, just a year ago as its first Chief Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Officer, and I will not be the last. And so I'm just uh, really honored to be in this seat at this time fighting for us um, underrepresented communities in, in every space. And I'm especially passionate and focused on making sure that creators with disabilities are a part of our strategy and our plan. And so I'm really happy to be here today for the first panel um, in 63 years uh, that the Recording Academy has had focused on accessibility. So shout out to everyone involved, Jennifer, Nick, Lauren, and Lachie, and, and all of you for being here. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's an honor. And it's, it's great to have all of you here. Um, thank you for taking the time out for this really important conversation. Um, to ensure access to our visually impaired folks, um, can we go around and give sort of a quick 10 second self description of what we look like? I'll go first. I'm an African American woman with long black hair, a white jacket, uh, channeling my inner Issa Rae and hoop earrings. Uh, and I'll just toss it to Galen. Galen, if you can give a quick visual description. Yeah, um, I am a small Caucasian woman. My arms are kind of bent at 90 degree angles, I guess. I'm sitting in my kitchen uh, with a big painting of sheep behind me and I'm wearing a black dress and a red hair clip in my dark brown hair. Thank you so much. Namel, could you please give a quick visual description of yourself? Well, um, okay. I'm like you, I'm an African-American guy. I'm wearing a red hat. Um, 
black and red shirt. Um, they both say Four Wheel City. That's the movement. You guys should get them on our website if you want to. And uh, <laughs> black shades and two chains, like two chains. There you go. <laughs> Gooch, could you please uh, give a self visual description? Yes, I am a devilishly handsome. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, black, the black hat and uh, tie dye with some prayer beads. <laughs> okay, I think all we got was devilishly handsome, and then we couldn't stop laughing. Um, <laughs> it's the truth. No. It's the truth. Uh, Saida Garrett, could you please give a quick visual description? I am a. Um, a uh, black woman uh, with a Frida Kahlo floral hail, uh, wreath on my head, uh, crown. I'm wearing a brightly colored um, geometric print blouse. I have long chocolate dreadlocks that are in a ponytail. And uh, I'm wearing pearl earrings and a string of fabulous pearls, darling. Oh, Just okay. All right. <laughs> Uh, Valesha, if you could please give a 10 second description of yourself. Yes. Hi, everyone. Again, I am a proud black woman uh, with a black leather headband on today with hair that's about 22 inches that does not belong to me. There you go. <laughs> Let's just go ahead and just say it sometimes. You know what I mean? <laughs> no, no need to fake it. And a black sweatshirt today um, because that's the mood I'm in. Uh, comfy, comfy working from my home office. I love it. I love it. All right, let's just get right into it. I'm going to toss a few questions to the panel. Um, I just ask that you state your name before you answer your question. For example, this is Lachi speaking and my answer is, et cetera, et cetera. So I want to start out with a rather big obstacle people living with disabilities face, which is why disability is not included uh, as a diversity. Um, I'd love to actually toss this to Saida first. So across all industries, you see name, you see, um, you'll see panels, you'll see talks, you'll see live streams that all talk about diversity in, you'll see them talking about race, you'll see them talking about religion and gender. Why not disability? You know, I, I didn't even think about that until I read what this panel was going to be about today. I had no idea that it wasn't included. Um, it's, it's a valid concern because I participated in the Oscars uh, either last year or a couple of, last year. And it was the first time that I'd ever seen um, a person or two or three people actually with disabilities that were included in the cast, in the choir that I was in on stage behind Cynthia Erivo. And I'd never noticed that before. And I think because it hadn't happened. I can't remember when, I, when I'd seen that uh, kind of inclusion in a program as large and worldwide as the Oscars. Um, I think the reason why employers don't really consider uh, to hire people with disabilities because they just don't want to take the extra effort that it will take to accommodate someone or people with disabilities. They just don't, they don't want to even acknowledge it because then that will be proof that they are being, uh, it'll be evidence of their discrimination. So they just ignore it. Um, I, 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 I'm happy that we're putting a light on this situation because I myself was ignorant to the fact that it was not included in, in, um, in what, I can't Right, even, right. Yeah, well, I, let me, let me Go ahead. I was just going to say, I wanted to toss it to um, perhaps Namel. Uh, why do you feel, why do you think disability is just, it's a long time coming to be included in diversity? Well, I mean, like personally, like, like she just was saying, I think like me coming from being in a wheelchair, a lot of the times um, I, I see it from a lot of different angles. And I think, all right, it's because before I was in the wheelchair, I used, I have, I feel like I have two brains. I have that brain and I have now my being in the wheelchair, which is like a disability brain. And I, I used to, and then I thought about it. This is why I do what I do now a lot is because I'd be like, I don't recall ever thinking about somebody with a disability before. Like she just said, I, I don't, I didn't remember really thinking about like what they're going through 
what they might need, um, what their day to day is like, or what just whatever. So I feel like that's what happens. And then there, there's like a oversight of that. And then if you think about the word disability, right? You already come in the door, somebody thinking you can't do something because of the word itself. So it's like that that loses value. They like you lose the value to somebody. So I think what happens is they don't even include us in the thought process, right. let alone just the idea of us. It's like, cause it's, it's been so weird. We're so conditioned to overlook people with disabilities primarily because yes. I think cause of the word. It's like, once we go into the room, we got a disability. Oh, so you can't do what I think you coming in the room to do as soon as you come in the room. So it's like, we always got to prove that. And sometimes we don't get the opportunity like me I hope to like be here to give insight to like, I feel like there's opportunity that needs to be given to prove and like we don't not necessarily prove, but I think that's why we don't get in those conversations as much because because of that um that 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 perception of being well, I mean, I feel like what the two of you are saying is very similar in the sense yeah. that because it's not forward facing because we don't see it enough in media we don't see it represented enough in a light that is not just hey you can't once we begin to see it more in that light of oh wow there are uh many accomplished musicians who have disabilities and you start to see it in media you start to see it on different entertainment shows it would start to become part of the conversation it seems like the overlooking statement is what we're kind of um talking about and I mean I guess one of the first steps is things like this um putting out to the general public conversations on disability showcasing people with disabilities um but I also think I know that the two of you are speaking from a perspective or at least you know Mel we're speaking from a perspective of someone who became disabled later in life and there are some folks on the stage that have been born with a disability and I think it brings me to my next question which you know, I think it's important for us to talk about just let's discuss actual accessibility in its most literal form. So venues, brick and mortar, getting into places, um, the music industry, stages and studios, they're not really the most accessible. And in some cases that might even impact like the ability for a musician to create, to get work, to accomplished the things that need to be accomplished to become that big musician, right? Um, and I know according to a study by Attitude is Everything done in the UK, because the US is very behind on studies of like major scale on numbers with disabilities, um, one in two disabled musicians encountered barriers, like literal barriers for their own gigs. So, what are some of the experiences you've seen with you've seen with this with inaccessibility and accessibility and what things can be done? Um, I want to pass this to you, Galen. Thanks. I know uh, you have a lot to say on this. <laughs> I do. I was like, well, I hope I get to answer this one. Um, so this is Galen, and I, you know, I've been touring since I won the Tiny Desk in 2016 full time. So that was my career right up until the coronavirus hit. And the places that I can play are extremely limited. Um, and this is a this is a huge issue that a place like the Recording Academy really could be taking the lead because the reality is, is so many venues, I can't get in the door, I can't use the bathroom, I can't get to the room where the stage is. And then that's just if I wanna attend a show. If I wanna perform at a show, a lot of times I can't access the stage because there's no ramp and then the green room is just like not even on my radar right now because it's so difficult to even find those basic um like accessibility um requirements that the idea that I would that I would say oh your venue is great except for it doesn't have a green room I can use it's like no I'll just get ready in the bathroom so the reality is is the the barrier to entry is so high right now. Um, it's a really urgent problem because this law, the Americans with Disabilities Act, which applies to for-profit private venues, hasn't been adhered to in 30 years. It's a 30-year-old law. And it's a civil rights law. It's not just a money financing law. It's really about, do we value equality in music or don't we? And if we do, then we have to stop 
supporting the places, but how shirking their duty to the law. Um, I stopped playing at inaccessible venues a couple of years ago. And if the venue isn't, uh, is accessible, but they don't have a ramp to the stage, I don't let them lift my wheelchair up anymore. I say, I'm just gonna play on the floor then because it sends a very obvious message to the audience that I'm not on the stage because I can't get up there. Um, and I've seen positive change, um, people building ramps for me, renting ramps, making it, um, when I drew a line in the sand and said enough is enough. And I think the more artists, disabled or non-disabled, who are willing to make these same stances, and especially with the backing of something like the Recording Academy, would be very powerful and would lead to a lot faster change that we are not seeing because it's being always shoved out to the periphery or seen as a cost liability rather than a civil rights issue, which is what it actually is. So very well stated. And I, I wanna say when we were here at the Recording Academy, and we do have Valicia here in the hot seat, hearing everything that we're saying. Um, and so I love that you're coming with, you know, an action item for change and solution. And I feel that that's the best way to have these conversations. We can voice our grievance, but at the same time, we can't expect people to make change if we're not able to sort of say what we want and how we can do it in a positive and, and a good way for everyone involved. Um, so I really love that you're saying that. And I want to have a follow-up to that, which you started to answer, um, but what are some ways the Recording Academy can help support? Um, and I want to toss this to Gooch, because I know you haven't spoken yet. Um, very handsome, devilish Gooch. Do you have, um, you know, anything to, to say regarding accessibility as well, and maybe ways that the Recording Academy and, and other such organizations can help in that effort? Yes, well, I travel around in a power wheelchair, so it's big, it's heavy, um, it's, you know, it's hard to get on stage. And uh, I remember back when I first started out, Robert Randolph actually jumped off stage. I went and saw Robert Randolph play and he invited me up to play with him, but there was no ramp to get on stage. And so he and his bandmates tried to lift me up onto the stage, almost dropped me and then ended up sitting on the ground in front of the stage. They ran a guitar cable out to, him, to me. So long story short is basically like, um, it really blew my mind what Galen said because I've been to so many gigs where they weren't accessible and I just found a way or like I went up a ramp that was kind of shady when probably what I should have done was what she did was just make a choice to stay in front of the stage and send that signal that, you know, this place is not accessible. Therefore, your show is not going to be as good if you come here. And a good friend of mine from Disability Pride Philadelphia um, always said, disability rights are civil rights and he would always say things like um we have to do do things like this event because once we all start getting together and we find uh, a way to uh you know show them where we spend our money where you know because i feel like we need to flip it on ourselves a little bit too and take some responsibility a lot of disabled people stay home they don't go out because the event so it's like it's like a thing where the venue might not be catering to them but they don't really want to go out either so like we have to we have to ourselves kind of like combine our efforts and our money and make our dollars speak and show that we show up to accessible venues that have you know that cater to everybody that are inclusive that you can see have thought of everybody's disability and and are including everyone and if we all start pulling together and spending our money in venues like that i think that you'll see other venues start to change their ways and be like, oh, well, they're, you know, they're getting more money. And, and I know that every venue I've ever been to that's accessible and really caters to that, they're usually like an awesome venue when it comes to food and beverage and everything else too. It kind of all starts there, you know, it's thinking of like the minutia. So that's, that's my piece on it. You know, that's a really good point that you make that a lot of these venues, when you take accessibility into consideration, you're just a better all around entity. And anyone can see that it just shows that you care about your artists, you care about your audience, and you just care and it makes it more welcoming and makes it more accessible, quote unquote. Um, another thing that you said that was really, like, kind of touched me is that, you know, one in four adults in America have a disability. 
And a lot of people don't know those numbers. 61 million Americans have a disability and a, a good majority are adults and older folks. And the disability community has almost a trillion in purchasing power. Um, why are we not tapping into that investment and taking advantage of it? Um, I don't know the stats for uh, nationally, but I do know in New York, uh, I think it's 74% of folks living in New York either have a disability or know someone with a disability closely in their family or a close friend. So the disability has the purchasing power and the influential power to really in, to flood in tons of dollars. And it's a shame and, and really just kind of a business fault not to be taking advantage of those numbers. Yeah, um, can I say something about that too? Go for it. Well, um, because I can't, it was hard for me not to let this topic go by and I mentioned because- uh, Can I, sorry to interrupt you. I just wanted to say that that's Namel speaking. Go okay, ahead. yeah, Namel, Tad Waters. And I'm, I just want to say, because I had to say something about this because my our whole movement with Four Wheel City started on the foundation of speaking out against um, inaccessibility. The song that we made, the movement, is the first song that really put us on the map. And it's directly saying, like, I was like, um, first I like to say, well, some peace to Christopher Reeves, but I got something on my chest that's been bothering me. What's the problem be when I'm out in the streets? It's like I can't go nowhere. What's wrong with me? I come when I go to the store. I got a call first to see if it's wheelchair accessible. I come, they treat me like a vegetable, y'all, like I ain't here. And I could say I don't care, but the truth is I can't walk up the stairs. So I need a ramp and an elevator too. And while you at it, bring accessible bathrooms, man. When you want the same thing, if it happened to you and it's like, well, um, to Four Wheel City. So we've been, <laughs> look, but it's a crazy thing. We've been performing that song all everywhere around the world. I have to sit in front of stage in front of people and, and, and perform this song as we can't get up on the stage. So it's like, it's like it bugs me out. Cause, and I also want to give um, Revolt a big shout out too, because on uh, the 25th anniversary of um, the Americans with Disabilities Act, we did the video for that song. And are you saying about New York City, 74%? The first um, disability pride parade that was in New York City, when the mayor was there from the video, we have that video and Revolt premiered it for us. And I felt like that was a groundbreaking moment within hip hop because it was like the disability, like it was on their homepage and it was like, um, Forward City come to talk about the ADA. So I feel right. like more things like that need to happen from the major mainstream people to shine light on it. But I guess it's hard to see it if they can't see it from the musical aspect because it's always like a pat on the back, but it's really more about, they got to see it just like a public enemy or things like that and, and give it that same reverence. And I think things will start to change. Um, I love that you said that. I mean, these, if anyone that's really like come in, in tune with the disability community knows that one of the most difficult things is to get it out from the echo chamber and out to the mainstream. Exactly. Um, and that's really the help that is needed. It's not a pat on the back that we need. It's not like, oh, you are so inspirational. Like, thank you so much for inspiring me to just roll out of bed and continue living my life and not doing anything to help the disability movement. So what we need are folks that are able to help us get that message out to the mainstream. You're absolutely correct. Last year, um, this is Galen. Can I quickly add something? Sure. Um, I just think that this is why it is so important to talk about disability as a form of diversity. Um, to me, and I'm coming from a different place than maybe Gucci or Namel, or I mean, all of you actually, I suppose. I was born with my disability. So for me to have um, like disability, you could not separate me out from my disability. It's just always been the way that I see the world. But the reason I think it's so important to include it as a form of diversity is right now, if you talk about disability and you say, what do you think of when you think of disability? People's words are not gonna be positive, right? It's until we say, you know what? Disability is completely natural. It's been here since human beings have been here. Um, in one form or another, disability affects all of us, 74%. That's a lot of people, right? Who, who are touched by disability. I think that if we don't start talking about it as something that is just a part of our identity that requires support and compassion the way that any other identity does, you know, your race, your gender, your um, sexual preference, like all of these things, 
um, are part of diversity. And when you treat disability that way, you can start to see that it that it like makes the world just like more welcoming, more diverse. We have better idea exchanges and we can take away the stigma so that it'll be more obvious. I think it's what I'm trying to say, obvious that it's being left out. If we only see it as a medical issue or as an accommodation issue, then we don't necessarily think, hey, that nobody got a Grammy with a disability last year. That's weird. Like we don't think about it because we don't see it as a form of identity. We see it as something else, but it really is our identity. And so that's that's why I think as diversity specifically, we need to really embrace that. And, and there's a lot of different views on disability. Like some people, it's been a really big struggle. Some people like me, it's just part of who I am. But we need to still say that it's an acceptable part of our culture that should be supported instead of ignored in the way that we support all other minorities, basically. And I also wanted to back that up. I mean, you know, someone earlier, I believe it was Namel said, the word disability itself yes. is, can turn folks off. Uh, however, I actually like the word disability. I know that people are afraid or, or don't really like the word dis, D-I-S, the prefix dis, but I am distinguished, I'm distinct, those start with D-I-S, and I have a disability. And I don't do things despite my disability. I do things because of my disability. And I encourage anyone with a disability watching this, that it's who you are. We need to start looking at things in the social model, like Galen said, as opposed to the medical model, which means um, that it's not about an impairment. If you're able to, if I'm able to access a staircase, if I, if you, if I have a wheelchair and you give me a staircase, I can't get up the staircase, but if you give me an elevator, I can. And all of a sudden I'm no longer quote unquote disabled because I'm able to get to the second floor. So just think of it that way. Um, the last question I kind of want to toss out there though, is kind of going back to what you just said, Galen, why is it that a lot of people that are able to not disclose don't. Uh, why don't we see this representation? Why is there a need to want to sort of not discuss it, to kind of hide it, even if it's from your own roster? Uh, I'm sorry, even if it's from your own um, writer, uh, there's a need to not want to disclose um, and get in front of your disability, and especially in the music industry, even more so than in acting and, and other forms. So I want to give this to anybody. Why is there such a problem with disclosure and how can we start encouraging folks in the entertainment industry and in the music industry to come forward and just stand in front of their disability so that we can really shake up this movement? Uh, this is Saida Garrett speaking. Um, it's interesting that you said that, but I, and I wanna thank Belisha for being here because it's hard to get a seat at the table when you're not invited in the room. So, the fact that we're, we're spotlighting this and being made aware that this is a deep and serious problem is, is one step in the right direction. I mean, it's not the answer, but it is a step in the right direction. These are movements towards where we want to be. La Lache, this is Ryan speaking. Go for it. Um, I just want to follow up on her point as well. And uh, my mom always told me, you know, since I've been in a wheelchair that, uh, she she would always say, um, you, you should be glad that your disability is on the outside because a lot of people's disability is on the inside and it can't be seen. So I think that is at the root of a lot of things as well. Like people, you can't see everyone's disabilities and, and a lot of people are ashamed of their disability, so they hide it. And I think that just goes back to the thing I was saying about all of us pulling our resources together and you talking about that $1 trillion spending power, you know, and, and start pulling ourselves into, you know, spending it on the right venues and the right places. Gooch, Saida Garrett here again. I, I just wanted to, to, to the point of hiding your disability. When I was first diagnosed, I was so afraid. I didn't tell anyone for a very long time not my friends, not my family, and especially not my peers and the people that I worked with because I didn't want to be looked at as someone who was disabled because there's an, like, like, like uh, Tapwater said, there's an automatic uh, 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 analogy of who you are and what you can do. And if they don't want to be bothered uh, 
with your accommodations, then you just don't get called for that gig. You just don't, you're not even considered. So I didn't want to let anybody know that I had an issue. But then I decided if I was quiet, then no one would know my story and I wouldn't inspire anyone to do anything because I was hiding. So when I decided to come out, I came out in a huge way. I came out on stage at an MS a, a gala. And when I said to the audience, I was just a performer until I said to the audience that I was diagnosed with MS. You could hear before I said that, a pin drop. After mm -hmm. I said that, there was an audible gasp from the audience. And I said to them, do you remember 10 seconds ago how you felt about me, what you thought about me before I told you I had an illness? Let's go back to that. Cause I'm still that same person that I was 10 seconds ago before I told you I had a disease. Right. Wow. I, I feel what you're saying too. This, this is the mail, by the way. And I, I just want to go back to just a little bit. When I when I first got in a wheelchair and um, I was rapping before that, but then afterwards, I didn't know what to do because I was like, I can't rap now, I'm in a wheelchair. And especially coming through hip hop, because hip hop is very like masculine and right. everything. And so the thing is, I, I, I was like, damn, what can I do? And I, I looked at somebody like Stevie Wonder and I was like, he was like the only person I could think of. I was like, well, his music is great and people just love him at the core for his music. So I was like, if I make good music, then I'll be accepted. But the thing was, like going back to accessibility, not being able to get in studios, oh, then it was like, I felt like someone was holding me back. But then I also thought like, wow, nobody never ever talk about disability anyway. So me as an artist, I started to want to talk about it. I wanted to break that barrier. I wanted to be like, I want to make, I want to make, I want to make some, like, why can't we talk about disability? Right. And I know nobody going to support it, but I'm going to show me and Rick, well, that's my partner, Rick, we want to show people how to do it. Like this poster right here was in like in a double XL magazine, right? Um, this is another one that was in like the daily news, right? And you see us sitting there in our wheelchair, I had, but we doing our thing. I have another one on the wall, we was on a uh, new mobility magazine, right? right. Rocking the mic. And they said a rap and rehab. So I'm just saying that to be like, we never, we never, we un always unapologetically disabled. I think unapologetic is like, unapologetic is the perfect word. And I feel like we have really put out a lot of new concepts to a lot of people, especially exactly. folks watching this and that will watch it. And actually we're, we're literally here sitting in front of the Recording Academy. We have Valacia. We're, Valacia, we're talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to give you the mic to, I, we've just been talking and going around and I just want to get your take on just some of the things we've been saying and just as chief DEI officer, just like what you're receiving. So first, thank you. Again, this is Belisha and thank you for um, just speaking so honestly about uh, not only how important this is, but the need. And um, I'm reminded of Lachi, some of the stats that you, you know, um, shared with us. And one of them that I was reminded of when I led inclusion at Google was that there are more than 1 billion people across the globe that identify as being a person with a disability. So not only is it the right thing to do, not only is it a human right, there's also a strong business case for it. And so, you know, my first message is for anyone, you know, watching or listening or part of this conversation today who's a part of a company or business, now is the time. Right, we cannot wait any longer, and I take full, um, you know, part in in my role in this. Um, one of the other stats I wanted to share that came from the Harvard Business Review is that ninety percent of companies say that they prioritize diversity, equity, and inclusion, but only four percent of them consider disability in those initiatives. So ninety percent say DEI is a priority, but only four percent of them have disability as a core value and priority. And so, you know, my response is, you know, we have the power to change that and to do it now in the music industry. For the first time ever in the history of music and the business of music, we now have chief diversity officers at all the three major labels. I meet with them every month. So Sony, Universal and Warner all have chief diversity officers and you have me at the Recording Academy. And so I think, you know, not only am I committed to doing the work that we need to do 
for creators with disabilities at the Recording Academy, but like let's roll up our sleeves and lock arms with the labels and with the touring companies and with the digital streaming services to also make sure that we're doing this together. And so I think it was Galen who said like, you know, it's time for us to work together. It's time for us to lock arms and, and really, you know, figure out like what does collaboration and partnership look like? And what are the goals that we're gonna set across the music industry? I think to your original question, Lachi, of why, why has this not been a priority? I think everything that you all said was spot on. And I'll add, if we're being you know, really transparent, which I promised I will always be um, in these conversations, DEI started as a, just a reaction, mm -hmm. right? To crisis, right? A reaction to you know, racial crisis, to you know, gender uh, concerns and issues and, and so many things. And because of it starting that way, as a reaction, right? It stayed that way in this constant state of reacting to whatever is a headline, right? So we know race, gender, ethnicity, you know, age have been like the hot button topics. And it's time for us to turn this up, right? Mm -hmm. I think it's time, you know, I, I love the honesty and I love the transparency and I love the action. And so to me, I think this conversation is the first of many and I'm committed to taking the next step to making sure that we're really putting our arms around what does action look like and a plan for it. Uh, one of the things that I'll share that we are already working on is, I think you all said representation matters and I agree. And so we're rolling out at the Recording Academy an inclusion index for the first time ever, a self ID campaign. So not only will we be capturing race, gender, ethnicity data, but for the first time ever, we're gonna be capturing disability data to know who in our chapters, who across our membership, voting and professional members, who's willing to disclose, to your point, you know, identifies as a person with a disability. So we know exactly where we need to go with our programming and our focus. So that's happening and it's happening this year. Um, but again, just one step of, of many more to come. And so I'm, I'm listening, I took all my notes, I know all my action items. Um, thank you, everyone. And I'm just ready. I'm ready to get to work. Okay, so a million things that I want to say to unpack, because it's very exciting. But um, I think that the main thing that I want to just say is, it's so like refreshing, you know, when something is said, and then it turns out that something is being done, like initiatives are being put in place, or even at the very least, talks are being happened, that talks are being happened, happening, <laughs> talks are being done behind the scenes in response to, to some of the concerns that are being put forth. So it makes me really excited to hear that, first of all, we are going to finally, like I said, attitude is everything, had all these percents and numbers, and the U.S. doesn't really. So it's really great that the Recording Academy is going to be able to start having numbers on disability. That's like huge all in and of itself. Um, and then the fact that the conversations are being had and leading to some of the other concerns that we have about accessibility, about representation, it starts here. I mean, this is our first fully accessible or generally fully accessible panel that we're having with the Recording Academy. And I mean, yes, it's happening because we're talking about accessibility, but we're going to continue to just try to roll out some of these things and incorporate it universally into other talks. And so I'm really excited that the Grammy, uh, that the Recording Academy is taking these initiatives and taking them seriously. And that's really like all that we could start to ask for. So I'm very grateful for everything that you said and everything that you're doing and that you've done so far. Um, and th the fact that there is a DEI officer in the first place. Um, and then secondly, that disability is being included as a diversity here. Um, Saida Garrett here. I have a quick question for Ms. Jones. What was it about this position that drew you to it? <laughs> that is such a good question. Thank you for asking. I'll ask it again. What about, no, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Saida. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's one of those things. I love music. That, that was my first love. My husband gets jealous when I say it, but you know, I've loved music for, from as early as I can remember. And my career started in music. And, you know, I, I worked for Obama, I worked for Google, led many of our disability initiatives there. And when the opportunity came for a chief diversity officer to be appointed at the Recording Academy, it was like, 
God said, go. I mean, honestly, I can't even, I can't, nothing about it made sense beyond that. I, it was in the middle of a pandemic. I was working for a very stable company. My parents, you know, didn't understand at all um, my choice. Um, but I had to listen to that voice inside of me that said, you, you are the person that is prepared, ready, and able to make this change. So go do it. And so that's why I'm here. It was really spirit led, uh, but, or I shouldn't say, but, and it's spirit led and I, I, I'm just ready to work. You know, I think we hit the ground running a year ago in the wake of George Floyd's murder and we have not stopped. It happened, his murder happened in my third week in role and we have been going full speed. And so, you know, I think when we speak about language, it matters so much. And, and one of the things that I knew um, in my first month in role, we've got to expand the definition of DEI. We've got to expand, you know, our focus. And, and I'm just, you know, I really feel honored um, to be able to do this. The last thing I'll say is that my mom is the um, senior director of the ARC of North Carolina. And so she has worked for persons with disabilities for over 50 years. And so I have a mom, an old school mom back in North Carolina that taps me on my shoulder to make sure that I'm getting this right. And so just know I've got pressure um, um, and love coming from a lot of places um, with such a, a, a real like understanding of why cre creators with disabilities has to be a part of the recording community's focus and, and we're here and we're gonna do it. Oh, yes. Thank you, mom, for that. Um, awesome. Thank you so much for that. And such a great question, Saida. Actually, I feel kind of jealous that I didn't ask it. Um, this has been such an awesome- Coming for your job, sister. I'm coming for your job. <laughs> this, has been, this has been a really necessary conversation, especially within the music industry. So I want to thank you all for coming today. Uh, we, uh, we definitely have to round up, um, but I want to thank- everyone for being involved. I want to thank the Recording Academy. I want to thank a Sign Nexus. I want to thank, I love Sharon Tapper. Thank you so much. I want to thank Valacia, the whole DEI team. I want to thank the New York chapter staff and um, the Share Services team who really helped to make today's um, panel program possible.